So the topic of this uh, uh, talk is classless closures for small embedded VM. Uh, it's actually a talk from another universe, in the universe when everything, where everything is memory constrained. It's totally different, and uh, if somebody says JVM in that universe, it never means hotspot. It's completely different JVM. This is the agenda. Uh, about one third of this talk is actually introduction to Monty JVM, and Monty is actually internal name of uh, language agnostic uh, runtime, uh, which comes conveniently bundled with a Java interpreter, uh, a Java dynamic compiler, and Java class library. And the rest is closures in Java, and class implementation of closures, and yeah, it's the discussion. First part, yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to sell you anything here, uh, uh, there. I will not show you legal slides either. Uh, it's not about any talk, and it's not about any product, and it's not about uh, any plans for the future. Uh, so, uh, what's CLD, CLD CHI VM? Uh, it's, uh, uh, what's CLDC? So this is an acronym for Connected Limited Device Configuration. And uh, I'll uh, explain a little bit uh, in more detail uh, later. And uh, this JVM uh, has a choice, a build time choice of uh, uh, four CLDC profiles. And it was first released in uh, 2003, so it's not something experimental, it's production. Um, it has a built-in uh, uh, hotspot implementation, so well-known technology, uh, based on profiler-driven uh, dynamic compilation, uh, optimistic speculative op uh, optimizations, dynamic de-optimization when necessary, and uh, we target to small mobile and embedded devices. Uh, some of them are shown here. Uh, originally, it was uh, targeted uh, to uh, dumb mobile phones, and when, uh, once they become extinct, uh, we had to find uh, a different land and we found controllers, so now we live mostly in controllers. Uh, and uh, 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 all these devices have a slow processor and slow memory. Uh, the memory is constrained and it starts with 16K and uh, our uh, range ends is somewhere around 16 megs of RAM and some amount of ROM, usually times uh, uh, more than ROM. Uh, this device may or may, or may not have a, an OS, and if it has an OS, it's rarely a fully uh, capable OS. So usually we, we deal with single process, uh, single or just a few native threads. Uh, there may or may not be a page protection and memory fi mapped files. Um, there may be no OS at all. It can be bare, bare metal. Uh, in case if somebody cares, these are target processors, there are various versions of ARM uh, with various coprocessors. Um, we also can uh, target Intel, just mostly for debugging and cross-compilation. Uh, we target Super Hitachi and Spark for cross-compilation only. Uh, now, what is CLDC? There are uh, three old versions of CLDC and one new one version. Uh, old versions were all uh, subsets of old GDK, GDK 1.3. Uh, in these uh, profiles, uh, there were no user-defined class loaders, no reflection except for class for name, uh, no serialization, no GNI and native co code in applications, no user-defined finalizers. Uh, and uh, this implementation together with a class library had to fit into 32K ROM and 160K ROM for virtual machine and the class libraries together. It's entire, uh, entire runtime. Uh, recently, it got uh, revised, and we got a subset of Java SE8. Uh, this new uh, spec released in April this year. Uh, now it supports new language features like generics, annotations, and other stuff and also retains all limitations of all the CLDC profiles, so all these limitations remain, uh, and nothing changes. There is also no invoke dynamic and no annotations with uh, runtime retention policy, so only class and uh, compile time. Uh, it requires more memory, uh, 128K RAM and 
half meg of ROM for VM and class libraries as well. So it's completely different universe, completely different restrictions. Anyway, uh, this is pretty advanced virtual machine. Um, so uh, it has manually optimized assembly interpreter. Um, it, it's necessary because most of the code is interpreted due to the lack of memory. Uh, we don't really have uh, memory for compiled code cache. And if we have it, it's pretty small uh, compiled code cache. Uh, we can use hardware, hardware acceleration uh, for Java. There are still uh, hardware uh, interpreters. Uh, the execution stacks are elastic and allocated in the object heap, so they can consume the entire heap if you need it. They shrink and grow as necessary. And uh, the set of bytecodes can be easily extended with the new internal bytecodes. It's just a matter of a few minutes to add new bytecode to the table and just to write uh, a few productions there. But obviously not many spare bytecodes left, just single byte uh, address space. Uh, next interesting thing is almost everything in this runtime is a runtime object. Not, not necessarily a Java object. Uh, examples of runtime objects but not Java objects are method, compiled method, execution stack, and so on, so on. Uh, and really any runtime object can be made Java object if, if it were necessary. But there are no uh, Java APIs for that and so they remain just runtime objects. It's very easy in this uh, uh, runtime to define new kind of runtime objects. It really can be any uh, representation. For, to define new uh, kind of runtime object, you need to define two functions and one function is optional, but really convenient. So required functions are object size. So given an object address, you have to be able to compute its, its size. Uh, second function is oops do. Uh, you, you pass two arguments. One is address of the object, and next is function. And this function must be applied to every reference field of this object. And the optional but uh, really convenient function is print on stream. It's uh, print, pretty printing for, uh, uh, it's necessary for convenience of debugging. If you, uh, in any debugger, you want to see this object uh, in a structural way, you just call this function and prints it to some stream, for example, to the console stream. Then uh, once you have these functions, you uh, have to uh, register this kind statically, and you get uh, the kind ID for this uh, uh, kind of objects, and you have to use it when you create these objects in the, in the heap. Also, this virtual machine supports a single pass dynamic adaptive compiler. It is optional. You can enable or disable it at uh, build time. Uh, it includes poseless incremental schedulable compilation. So you never actually experience uh, any pauses due to uh, uh, compilation. Compiler uh, runs as a coroutine to the interpreter, and uh, its activations are pretty well controlled. You can say compiler to run for some time, or you can uh, uh, interrupt this compiler at any time and just let it stay with the saved state in the heap until next activation. This, con uh, this compilation is driven by dynamic profiler. Uh, it combines sampling and instrumentation. It's uh, very different from hotspot compiler. It's not based on any counters at all. Um, compiled code and temporary data are located in distinguished area of the heap. Um, so everything's actually located in Java heap because we don't have any memory except for that heap. We don't have native memory around. Uh, this compiled uh, code area is uh, relocatable and resizable. So compiled code moves in the heap, and if you want to debug something at native level, it can be a nightmare. Your breakpoints will just go away because the address has changed. Um, uh, but uh, fortunately, you don't need to uh, assign any, uh, uh, you don't need to control this uh, area manually. It, it works automatically, it just, just works. Uh, Execution of, of compiled code is also profiled, and uh, compiled code cache automatically evicts cold code, uh, and uh, it, it does it without any garbage collection. It, it's very fast and very predictable. It's a single pass compiler. It doesn't construct any IR uh, to save memory, uh, and does direct abstract interpretation of bytecodes. Uh, regardless of this simple architecture, it can do uh, quite a number of interesting optimizations. It does constant folding, 
uh, as a side effect of abstract interpretation. It's not really an optimization, just a side effect. It does type constant and copy propagation. Uh, it uh, does pretty interesting kind of, com uh, of common sub-expression elimination. Uh, this kind is based on uh, its limpiozive like compression of uh, bytecodes. You have a dictionary and you have uh, um, uh, uh, expressions, uh, strings of bytecodes annotated as registers, and it just replaces uh, uh, this string with a reference to the register. Um, it also does null check and check cast elimination, uh, limited depth in alignment of method calls. Uh, uh, the depth is limited uh, mostly because it's not easy to uh, de-optimize one compiled frame into several interpreted frames, uh, not on the top of, of the stack. Um, it does speculative devisualization, actually does its unguarded uh, variant, so there is no any guards compiled into the code, it's not really necessary, and it does loop and branch optimizations. Also it has system class prelinking, also known as remization. Uh, that's pretty interesting uh, technology. System libraries and pre-installed applications are loaded at build time into a special version of virtual machine. These classes are selectively initialized at build time, and then they're aggressively optimized for size and speed. Uh, we have two different modes, open and closed build. Um, uh, it does reduction of uh, strength reduction of interface and virtual method calls, so it tries to, to make it as static as possible. Uh, it eliminates unreachable methods, fields, and classes. It does a, a selective ahead of time compilation, so you can choose what method to compile statically. Uh, it, it strips uh, symbolic information, so many of your fields and methods and classes became nameless after this conversion and saves space. It merges constant pools and then places into ROM, so they're not really modifiable, and they're shared between the isolates. So, yeah, and it, it, it generally separates mutable data from immutable data and places immutable data, data into ROM because ROM is cheaper than ROM. And then it generates text image. This image is compiled and linked into, into virtual machine executable. So we don't have any uh, RT jar. This RT jar is part of the executable and it's already represented there. It's already loaded into memory when this virtual machine starts. Uh, this remiser reduces static and dynamic footprint of virtual machine and greatly reduces VM startup time. It has a generational mark and, uh, and compact garbage collector. Actually, there are three garbage collectors, but uh, they're about the same uh, algorithm. One of these collectors is based on chunky heap, uh, two others are contiguous heap. Um, uh, this, the choice of the algorithm is uh, due to high heap occupancies, usually above 80%, so any copying collectors would not work well there. It provides linear allocation and sliding window compaction. Uh, so we compact just in a sliding window within the heap. It's not necessary to, compile, uh, to compact the entire heap. Uh, the collector, all, all of these collectors preserve allocation order. Uh, to this, uh, Usually, uh, preservation of allocation order guarantees pretty good locality, and also it helps to eliminate cross-references in persistent groups of, uh, of objects. Instead of going through the references, you can use address arithmetic to uh, um, uh, access this, the objects in this group. And they use this in uh, various tricks, uh, in particular to expose some runtime objects uh, for Java. Instead of having cross-references, we just do address arithmetic. And there will be examples later in this talk. Uh, also, this virtual machine runs virtual, multiple virtual threads over a single native thread. We have our own scheduler, and um, there are various uh, uh, scheduling policies that can be changed. Um, also, it does multitasking within single native process, known as isolates. This task, this task priorities, resource quotas, and shared libraries, uh, so it can be probably called multi-tenancy. We never use this uh, name internally, but it is. And this multitasking guarantees synchronous native finalization and isolate termination. And all native resources are guaranteed to be uh, uh, returned to the system. So actually, you can rely on this when you write your programs. And it has a lightweight native interface. Uh, here, we are not trying to 
uh, write uh, native code in Java. Uh, we, we assume that library developers are convenient in writing in a mixture of C++ and Java, and they're not trying to, to shift the boundary between the two. They're trying to, to make this uh, interfaces easier and more convenient. Uh, uh, the interface is actually uh, performed mostly uh, a generated C++ structures. So this remiser run and runs, it generates C++ file where uh, each uh, Java object structure is represented by C++ structure with uh, various uh, in uh, uh, functions. You can use this function to access uh, components of this Java objects and to change the components and so on and so on. Also, it supports KNI. Uh, native interface, it's de facto standard for small virtual machines. And there is no GNI, and there actually cannot be GNI here. Now, uh, there is a concept of bytecode quickening. Uh, it's a pretty old concept. Uh, essentially, oh, in interpreter rewrites some bytecodes during execution. Uh, when necessary, uh, the method can be quickened by request, so uh, that we go through all bytecodes and quicken them, trying to quicken them. Uh, when interpreter quickens a bytecode, it resolves symbolic references, validates the semantics, and if this is successful, it patches the bytecode with a quicker version. So, uh, the, the patching is performed to avoid repeated quickening of the same bytecode, and uh, one of the uh, limitations that bytecode uh, size has to remain the same. Otherwise, we have to re uh, uh, change uh, uh, various branches around it, and that's really not the point of this very local uh, change in the bytecode. Uh, if uh, bytecode size reduces, we can pad uh, uh, the sector sp space with knobs. In particular, uh, following bytecodes are quickened. Get static, get filled, um, in various kinds of invokes, uh, instance of and check cast. After they're quickened, there are no symbolic references, just uh, indices and numbers. Uh, also, quick, uh, frequently used sequences of bytecodes can be replaced by faster super instructions like a load zero, fast a get filled the number. Uh, that's end of the introduction to Monty, and now closed in Java. All, all, all these details were necessary uh, um, as a background to the implementation of closures, of classes closures in Java. Uh, the first slide is uh, closures. Uh, closure is a function or reference to a function together with environment referenced by this function. It was introduced in Scheme programming language back in 1975-80. Uh, in state of programming languages, a function can modify its environment and uh, uh, the const uh, the, uh, you can find them in uh, blocks in Smalltalk and self, or activation record in uh, programming language beta. And locals of outer scopes in such languages can be modified. And there is a nice example in uh, Smalltalk, if I remember it correctly, from these days when you just... Here, uh, there are two uh, closures, one for just to increment uh, a local, another uh, one is for loop body. So integer one gets a message to do with two arguments, uh, another integer 10 and uh, a block. And a block calls various, uh, sends various messages and uh, if true gets uh, an argument uh, uh, with a closure. And here you can essentially change the local and it would be nice to have this thing in Java, but uh, Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, Java has different execution semantics, so we cannot really change outer uh, locals in outer scopes. Um, closures in Java can be modeled with inner classes and lambda expressions in uh, Java 8 uh, or later. And as I said, non-local variables uh, are captured and cannot be modified. That's the difference from the blocks. Uh, you probably know everything about lambda expressions in uh, Java 8 plus, so probably I can uh, skip the slide. Uh, except for uh, why do we want uh, to use lambda expressions in CLDC? If we don't have invoke dynamic, uh, why we need expressions? Well, they're convenient and expressive, uh, so we want to have them. Uh, unfortunately, there is no invoke dynamic and Java lang invoke package. Uh, just never considered to be there. Uh, but there is a trick. Uh, we can uh, consider invoke dynamic for lambda metafactory as an idiom. 
it's not, uh, so we don't really understand what's in log dynamic and we don't know what's lambda meta factory. But th that combination may have special meaning for the interpreter. And we're going to use this trick in implementation of closures. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is just an example of uh, uh, implementation of closures in old Java. And I need this example just to show next slide. This not a bunch of code. And this class just capturing one value. And if you uh, translate this class, it turns into a horrible amount of strange things in the heap. And if you look at this uh, object, objects closely, you can find that each, every field has perfect sense and uh, they're all necessary. There's nothing to optimize, but altogether, uh, they're un uncomparable with a very small uh, lambda body. So you express some semantic action with just a few bytes and they explode into something horrible. And it's, uh, the total overhead of all these fields is at least 50 words, so 200 bytes just for nothing. And if you look a little bit close at uh, class, my class, you can uh, see there at the very top uh, um, interesting optimization how to turn a uh, runtime object into Java object. So we have Java mirror, uh, it's a Java representation for instance classes, and we have internal class, uh, internal object instance class, it starts with header, and instead of having cross references between uh, internal object and Java mirror, we use address arithmetics to, uh, to uh, address Java mirror from internal class and internal class from Java mirror. We know that they are ordered in the, in the heap and that uh, our garbage collector uh, uh, keeps the order, so the offsets remain constant all the time. So uh, I think uh, this is a horrible mess and we have to get rid of it. Um, now, uh, classes implementation of closures. Let's just throw away all this stuff and do a much simpler thing. And by the way, that picture did not show uh, a constant pools, it did not show uh, array of descriptions of fields and did not show any instances of closures. Uh, they just, just don't fit into one slide. So uh, we'll throw away all these classes and just introduce internal runtime objects and make these internal runtime objects visible to Java. So uh, every instance of such objects uh, consists just of four, uh, actually of three, uh, words and uh, may have variable size extension for captured values. Uh, these three uh, uh, words are, first of all, header, which is necessary for garbage collector. Also, it, it identifies Java class, and uh, this Java class is simple closure. It's hidden abstract instance class, which extends object. You cannot really access it, but we need to have it uh, to be a valid Java object. Uh, if necessary, it can override uh, inherited methods, uh, inherited from object equals hash code and two string. Uh, currently, we don't do it uh, because it's not really necessary, but it's easy to do. Uh, next field is method. It's actually a reference to a method of any class uh, which has to have compatible type. Uh, and this compatibility has to be guaranteed by construction of this object. We don't really check it anywhere. Uh, next word consists of two parts. First is my function id, which is a, a, an identifier of the implemented interface. Uh, in our system, there can be a maximum of 16K classes, so this uh, field can, uh, can, can fit in, in 14 bits. And uh, second part of this uh, word is uh, a number of arguments and op map packed together into one integer. So uh, it contains number of captured words and a bitmap of pointers among them. So it, it, can, it, it can encode up to 14 or 17 uh, captured values. Uh, my statistics shows that uh, usually, at least in CLDC applications, you don't need to capture more than four values in any of practical cases, and we have just, here we have more than enough for, for them. Um, Next slide about relaxed type compatibility for fully quickened methods. So fully quickened methods have some nice properties uh, which original methods don't have. Uh, 
Quick byte codes are fully resolved. So there are no symbolic, symbolic references of any kind. They're replaced by addresses, offsets, and indices. Uh, access rights are already validated during the quickening, so we don't really need to complain about anything. Just pure executable code. Um, method is fully quickened if it contains only quick versions of bytecodes uh, and invoked only by quick bytecodes. So it's like everything is quickened. Uh, and if we work with only uh, fully quickened uh, uh, methods, uh, um, we can relax type compatibility of these uh, methods. So a uh, static method of a class taking the same number and order of arguments is equivalent to a uh, uh, method of the same, of, to the virtual method of the same class uh, with the same arguments except for the first one. We don't really care whether it's virtual or static. It's the same number of arguments and it's just a function for us. Uh, and so if we work with quickened uh, 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 methods, we can move static methods from one class to another class without breaking anything. It's just a function that doesn't really belong to classes and we can just move it. And we'll use it to eliminate classes. We, we uh, remove all functionality of a class and can throw the, uh, the rest of the class away. Now, uh, how we invoke simple closures? Uh, once we change internal representation, now we have two, diff uh, two different representations of uh, functional interface. It can be either regular class or this special representation. And as a Java type system cannot distinguish between these two uh, representations, we have to do it at runtime. And uh, uh, actually, uh, dynamic or ahead of time compiler may have a richer type system and it, can, it could distinguish uh, in certain cases, uh, these two uh, forms, and it can throw away certain computations. So there may be no, uh, uh, any no there may be no implications for performance at runtime, depending on on the compiler. Uh, so uh, to handle this uh, two different representations, we have to patch uh, four bytecodes, in, uh, invoke special, invoke interface, is instance of, and check cast. Uh, we don't need to, uh, to modify uh, invoke virtual uh, because for, virtu uh, for final classes, invoke virtual is always quickened to in in invoke virtual final. Uh, and it doesn't really depend on uh, representations. It just makes a direct call to the method address. So how we modify these bytecodes? It's, it's pretty easy and straightforward. We just check for the class of... Uh, uh, the representation, and uh, if we get the simple closure, we just read a method field from the simple closure and invoke it. Otherwise, we do ordinary uh, uh, table lookup by method index. Uh, similar thing happens with uh, invoke interface. Um, and instance of it has to be modified so that if we have a simple closure, uh, we have to handle, uh, we have to uh, look up through a superclass chain of this simple closure, but fortunately there is just one superclass and it's object. Um, so um, we just check for object ID and if it's so, any uh, class is actually subclass of object, so we return true here. Otherwise, we uh, get class from, uh, we essentially delegate this re request in for, for, uh, for uh, the implemented interface and just return uh, the result of this function for implemented interface. And a uh, check cast is similar to uh, instance of, but it throws exceptions to the, instead of returning uh, a Boolean. That's essentially the, implement, uh, the changes in the interpreter. We don't really need to change anything else, and it starts to work with a different representation. Now, how we create simple closures? Uh, we introduce new internal bytecode, new simple closure, and it uh, gets three arguments from uh, 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 extension of this bytecode of, or, or, or from a constant pool. Um, so it essentially gets interface ID, uh, method, and uh, args map, the same meaning as in presentation. Um, it creates new simple closure with a known number of arguments, initializes interface ID and method fields, and it pops a block of data 
from stack uh, of the, uh, to the captured field. So it doesn't really care whether those pointers are words. It just gets a block of data and saves it inside the object. Just plain data copy. Uh, we could use mem copy, but just ordinary loop works fine for us because there are not so many words on stack. Uh, after we copy it, we have to uh, uh, adjust SP. Uh, there is no need in write barrier because just it's newly created object and stores a newly created object don't need to be covered by write barrier. Um, type correctness of uh, these fields uh, must be guaranteed by bytecode construction. So this mask must be correct. Uh, the question here is, uh, do we have enough space at the capture side to generate this bytecode instead of uh, uh, the existing bytecode without expansion of the method size? For all Java, the answer is positive. Uh, it actually perfectly matches what's written in bytecodes. For new Java, the answer is negative uh, because invoke dynamic takes less space than uh, this new bytecode would require. Then, uh, essentially, we have to move my interface ID from bytecode to constant pool, or we can store it in the method uh, itself. Um, so how we create a simple closure in old Java without invoke dynamics? So we had a new uh, for declared class. It takes three bytes, then dub, and uh, loading uh, captured values. There may be more than one. And then we have a call to invoke special to initialize this class. It's another three bytes. After the conversion, we have a load and other uh, captured values, and then this new byte code that replaces exactly the same number of bytes. So everything's fine, uh, except for maybe exception table. Uh, we may need to uh, update it because byte codes, uh, a load zero, and the rest have moved. So it may need the adjustment. In new Java, when we have invoke dynamic, we have these arguments uh, on stack, and we have invoke dynamic uh, uh, with call side specifier, and uh, this uh, bytecode takes five bytes. The uh, last two bytes are zeros, but not really important here. Uh, and we want to, con to uh, convert it into a load, the same thing, and uh, a little bit different uh, bytecode that also fits into five, five bytes. Uh, there is a difficulty to overwrite constant pool entries because const constant pool entries are shared between the bytecodes. And so we have to be careful about writing existing entries. Uh, and it's not easy actually to uh, add new entries. Um, oh, there are some difficulties. So uh, now, how we convert uh, for simple closures in old Java? Uh, the class implemented the interface is created statically. It contains virtual method implemented the interface method. Uh, so we need to check if the class can be converted to simple closure. And after we, uh, if it can be, then we have to adjust the reads of captured values in the method. Uh, because offsets of captured fields is different in simple closure. It has three word header. And the original Java class uh, objects it has one word header. So we need to adjust them. Also, Java stack may grow upwards or downwards, depending on configuration. And uh, I found it easier to uh, reorder fields, except for changing this capturing routine in all uh, supported instruction set architectures, just less work. Uh, so we adjust field offsets in instance uh, field descriptors before quickening the method. And this change gets propagated to compiled or interpret uh, quickened code automatically. Then we convert the signature of the, uh, to the static method from virtual method. Uh, move this static method to the closest outer Java class. And then we dispose the implementing class as unnecessary and just it, it has no, there are no, no references to this implementing class. What's that? And when instance class can be converted to simple closure? when it's final, when it extends object, and when it implements single functional interface. Then, when it contains no fields or methods except for the implemented functional method and the constructor. Uh, and the constructor has to initialize every field by the respective argument. The order can be different, but this rule should, should stay. Um, it contains only resolvable symbolic references. So if something is not resolved, we cannot convert this class into simple closures. 
Um, and when it's referenced only at capture site to create a closure. So uh, unfortunately, anonymous class is just a class with mangled name. So you can actually reference anonymous class in any way. Um, and unfortunately, the enclosing scope of the inner class definition is lost during compilation to the class file. So if you uh, uh, write a, 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 a local class within some uh, block in the method, it becomes, uh, in class file, it becomes uh, package private. So it's not local in any closed scope. Uh, uh, you can load later some classes into the same package and actually access this class. And uh, we don't want to deal with this. So this, uh, once the class becomes local in, in the package, you cannot really prove anything for this class. You can only guess. You can provide reliable heuristics, but not real proof. And that's the problem with this approach. Now, how we can con convert to simple closures for new Java? Here, lambda body is, is represented by a method uh, of the enclosing class, and uh, all captured values are passed as arguments. Um, it's a little bit different from old Java. Now, uh, it would be really nice if we could just push, of block, uh, push the block of previously captured values to stack and call this method. So we, we had closure and lambda arguments, and then we put some captured values at the end and, and call this method. Unfortunately, no, we cannot do that because according to the rules, uh, number and order of arguments in uh, lambda body is different from uh, what we expect and the types can be different too. So uh, adapter method has always to be generated. There is no way to avoid this. Uh, uh, we, we can make this adapter method static in the same class as the lambda body. Um, and to do this conversion, we have to uh, re-implement uh, uh, some uh, methods of lambda meta factory in the runtime in native code. Uh, and, and when we generate the adapter method, it may require boxing, unboxing, and widening conversions of the arguments and the result. Now, interesting question of transparency of simple closures. So uh, we do this transform. Is it really semantically transparent? Can you find that, that classes are replaced? Well, actually, if you write closure get class, then the class returned by this closure uh, will always uh, be different than the class returned with closure implemented by in traditional way. So this class is, is the same for all simple closures, and this uh, equivalence of classes can, is actually observable in various ways. Uh, then uh, this return class can never have the same properties as the respective internal class. For example, if you get the class and try to create new instance, you will never create any object. It will just throw an exception. Uh, next thing, if you use is assignable from method for this, uh, for, for the class of the closure, it always returns false, regardless of interface implemented by the instance. It just know, knows nothing about the instance, so it cannot really answer this question correctly. Uh, fortunately, uh, this method is not part of all the CLDC profiles, and it was just introduced in CLDC 8, and not really used anywhere, and I'm still not sure whether this semantic difference is important or not. Uh, uh, maybe somebody can tell me if it's real, uh, if, if it's really important, uh, because um, I read uh, new Java language specification. It's very careful about the classes of closures, uh, and I don't know if this is important. Uh, uh, then, uh, if it's important, there is a workaround. Uh, uh, so a closure get class could create a fake Java class lazily. If you call this method, which you're not supposed to do, uh, it can create uh, this class. This class can be shared uh, between actually must be shared between all simple closures created by the same uh, capture site. Uh, so a uh, class ID must be uh, allocated eagerly and recorded somewhere. And uh, this uh, easily created class must be uh, in correct relation with the uh, interface and the instances. But it can be disposed as soon as there are no references to this fake class. Uh, 
Now, which Java is better for simple closures? So we have uh, new and old implementation. Essentially, uh, which one is better? Uh, so I, uh, I will compare them uh, to ideal implementation, where we have just one statically generated method, and uh, where all captured values can be represented as fields or tail arguments of this method, uh, while the head arguments must be compatible with the interface. That would be ideal implementation for simple closures, just have everything statically generated and just modify the behavior of uh, invoke interface byte code. Uh, both old and new Java deviate from the ideal uh, representation. In, in old Java, uh, old Java generates a method with matching arguments, but it's located in a wrong package, private class. Uh, all references to that class have to be analyzed, and well, analysis could be easier if a class could be local within the method, but in, class, in, in current format of class files, it's just not possible. There's no such thing as class local within the method. Uh, then, uh, uh, to, to check uh, applicability of this uh, transform, bytecode's capture site must be analyzed and rewritten. So there are some annoyances. In the new Java, new Java generates a method in the proper class, but with wrong arguments, wrong for this conversion. Uh, an additional adapter method must be generated by a virtual machine. Uh, so it's, first of all, it's additional method and additional call. So there are certain memory and performance overhead for this additional method. And this adapter method usually takes the same or uh, uh, more memory as the original uh, Java, uh, 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 Lambda body. And also, bytecode generator does not naturally belong to this virtual machine. We never needed it before, and we have to just put this bytecode generator inside just to do this conversion. And uh, actually, this bytecode uh, generator is more complex and more heavyweight than the rest of this implementation. Just alien part and it just should not be there. Uh, now, uh, note on bridge methods and marker interfaces. Uh, um, bridge methods are artifacts of generics in Java type system. They do not naturally belong to closures and lambda expressions, just an artifact. Now, marker interface is, from my point of view, is just value add-on for lambdas. That also do not naturally belong to close the lambda expressions. Uh, uh, this marker interface comes with certain memory overhead, and it, they are not really used in CLDC. Uh, just, uh, also, the, uh, there is a performance overhead in current implementation of invoke interface, instance of and check cast byte codes, uh, because instance uh, interface table lookup is linear on the number of implemented interface, regardless of number of methods in these interfaces. Well, hopefully, uh, bridge uh, methods and marker interfaces can be omitted in CLDC subset of, uh, 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 of lambda expressions. Uh, but in case if they aren't, how would, we, would I implement this uh, simple closures? Well, simple closures with bridge methods. They become a little bit more complicated. Uh, I, add, I would add a, a reference to call site. I would introduce special new kind of objects uh, like called static call site. It would contain a number of uh, uh, bridge methods and interface ID and references to those bridge methods. Uh, I would have to modify uh, certain uh, uh, byte codes again. So invoke interface, invoke special, and instance of, and check cast become different. And if I had to add both bridge methods and marker interfaces, I would need to add more fields to this static call site. Essentially, I would put everything there and share it between uh, all uh, closures sharing the same uh, static call site. Um, so this picture is not as terrible as ordinary classes, but, but becomes close to it, and I'm not really sure whether ordinary classes are that terrible to replace them with the structures. Uh, there is a, an alternative approach. We could reduce number of generated adapters by a runtime specific external converter. So we could pass the output of Java C through this converter to generate uh, classes specific for the runtime. And again, I'm not sure it's correct approach or not, but it can partially work. Uh, that's essentially it.
Any questions? Yes. Yes, okay. but uh, uh, again, uh, I, I cannot claim that, uh, that yesterday, for example, John said it's, it's very actually important, nice goal. Uh, if you, you, you don't force uh, users to choose between nice and clean things and performant things. Here, unfortunately, you have to choose. I can reduce the memory overhead, but I cannot reduce performance overhead. There is still additional interface call and direct call from adapter method to lambda body. This is slow. And uh, this, uh, this dynamic compiler will not eliminate this uh, because it, it cannot really inline these things. You usually run without dynamic compiler, and if you run with dynamic compiler, there's not enough space in the compiled code cache. 